Okay, hi guys, and welcome to another unsponsored watch review. Today, we revisit the Metal G-Shock. This is actually one of the smallest Metal G-Shocks ever made, but not only that, in a wider sense, it's an indication of the direction that G-Shock and Casio are going. And it's equally um, an exciting, baffling, simultaneously a triumph and a bit of a big disappointment all at the same time. Uh, even if you're not necessarily interested in this watch there is a lot of uh, interesting things to discuss so uh, without further ado i'll first do a um, wristwatch check and i'm wearing the fortis cosmonaut but i have to say i have enjoyed day date complications the most over the last year i just uh, i really have difficulty remembering what day of the week it is i don't know if it's me getting older or uh, perhaps um, working from home a lot uh, it, it just seems every day seems to kind of bleed into the other anyway back to this watch here uh, let's discuss a little bit of the backstory the history to fully contextualize uh, before we discuss the controversies and uh, more of the details of this particular model The world-changing history of the G-Shock has been chronicled many times on this channel. Today, it still remains one of the most accessible and affordable true watch icons. After dropping and breaking a traditional mechanical pocket watch given to him by his father, Japanese inventor and engineer Kiko Aibe first conceptualized the idea of the G-Shock in 1981. Over the next two years, with endless experimentation and over 200 prototypes, the G-Shock was fully realized in 1983. The reason for such a long process of development was the watch needed to survive the rigors of what Ibe called the Triple Ten standard, meaning it would have to have a battery life of 10 years, have a water resistance of at least 10 bar, and could survive a fall of 10 meters. The solution was the shock-resistant 10-layer design, protecting the quartz timekeeping module in the center, including a urethane rubber bumper, the hardened mineral glass watch crystal, the stainless steel screw-down case back, and the floating module, where the quartz mechanism floats free in a urethane foam cradle. This inevitably made the watch always rather large, despite the relatively light weight, until of course today. But regardless, the watch would go on to be extremely successful its toughness would make it the choice of military personnel the world over, countless space missions as it was flight qualified for NASA, and permeated into almost every facet of popular culture. As we approach almost 40 years later, it's evolved into endless variations, with a myriad of complications, and even breaking Guinness World Records for the heaviest vehicle to drive over a watch. In 2017, Casio celebrated its 100 millionth shipment of G-Shocks worldwide, and a year later, to demonstrate to the world that it should be respected as much as a real watch, the watch went full metal with stainless steel for the first time. The hype and reverence by watch enthusiasts was immense. Even the elitist watch publications who normally scoff at affordable watches jumped on the bandwagon. I myself purchased one and reviewed it, and while it was somewhat divisive, as it was seen by some as a departure from its utilitarian roots, it was a fun and enjoyable watch. However, the added weight made it uncomfortable during cardio, causing blisters even after a long run, which is when I typically wear my G-Shock on a daily basis. Aside from the added weight of the thick metal case, the design was based on the original DW5600 square of the very first G-Shock in 1983. The diameter at the widest point is 38.5 millimeters. We got a rather impressive slenderness of 10.5 millimeters. Lug to lug, I would say that's 44.3 there. The lug width is rather large at 22 millimeters, but don't be fooled, it's actually uh, only 16 where it attaches to the case, and we'll discuss this a little bit more later on. Just so you get an idea of the scale, let's compare it to the quintessential typical G-Shock. This is my DW5600E. This is about um, 40 to 50 bucks. Uh, I've had this for absolutely donkey's years, and you can see it's substantially smaller. Let's pull in a Tudor Submariner. There you get a real indication of just how small it is. Uh, or even, let's, uh, for the sake of it, put the classic 
Casio F91W, it's not that much bigger. Quite astounding um, that they've managed to miniaturize the 10 layer system. The weight is fantastically comfortable. In fact, it's only 50 grams, lighter than it's all resin bigger brother here. The watch comes on this plain, uh, rather rudimentary resin strap there uh, with an unsigned stainless steel buckle. However, we do get the spring bar uh, the, the bolt action style spring bars which are very nifty and you can remove the strap without the need of any tools. If we look at the screwed down case back, uh, it's your typical affair, no difference here uh, in a brushed finish. In terms of the main case, it's almost entirely high polished uh, with the exception of little um, surfaces on the sides there. And this is very deliberate and we'll discuss this uh, why precisely in just a moment. And of course, as you can see there, we have the negative display. Now, the, my light box is very unforgiving, but it is excellent. If we pull in the um, A1000 that I previously reviewed that had this appalling, look at the difference. It's um, so much more clearer, much easier, and also at different angles, it's, it's far more legible. So yeah, look at it there. You can't even see it. It's crazy. This is thanks to a new uh, module inside. Uh, from Casio. The full size has the 3229, which came out in 2010. This has the miniaturized 3489. Pretty much it functions exactly the same. The only difference is they've made it smaller. When this module was actually released, I'm not quite sure. I haven't seen it in any other uh, G-Shocks prior to 2020. So I'm going to assume it was released along with this watch for the very first time, which is pretty cool. Aside from your typical functions, you've come to expect this newer G-Shock module has the electroluminescent backlight with afterglow, which is absolutely outstanding. And as you can see, the negative display is uh, very, very crisp. The battery life is approximately two years, but excessive use of the afterglow will decrease that time. One thing I really love about these newer modules is they do have the flash alert extremely useful. Uh, I use it all the time on some of my other Casios. And also I do like the way that if you scroll through the functions, for example, if you're on um, the uh, stopwatch there, it does still display the local time. I love this layout. As with all metal G-Shocks, the buttons are a lot larger, far more ergonomically uh, efficient. Something I've always found annoying about actually, uh, let's just bring it in so you can see what I mean, about your conventional uh, typical G-Shock is that they are rather small, but uh, sometimes tricky to actually hit reset. So I love these, these vastly improved uh, buttons there. The function of each button is, is exactly the same as before. So it's just as uh, intuitive. There's no learning curve with these watches whatsoever. So aside from it being almost as thin as a dress watch, uh, it remains with a extremely high 200 meters water resistance, uh, which is just fantastic. In terms of how it wears, this is perfect for the six and a half inch uh, or less size wrist, even seven inches you could uh, pull this off. The diminutive size ha somehow makes it feel more solid, makes it feel a little bit more luxurious. I can't really explain. I don't know if that's my own preconceived connotation I have. Who knows? Maybe that's just me. It's not top heavy like uh, the larger one that I used to own. The smaller lug to lug, you know, it's really going to sit there with very little movement. So in terms of style and design, this is where it gets interesting. Like its bigger full-sized brother that preceded it, uh, the GM5600B1, the display is kept minimal. So as you can see, there's very little information on it. Uh, no superfluous extra text, uh, brick patterns like the original, or lines segmenting the layout, uh, and no additional logos, just very concise indications of all the functions. I really like this. I, I, I think it's very clean, um, somehow more modernist, I think. They've also simplified the bezel. If you look, there's no engraving now. Yeah, for me, it's a bit of a shame that uh, they didn't do it in a brushed finish. I, I really liked that. It gave it more of that uh, Patek Nautilus-esque feel. But the reason for this was very specific indeed. In fact, uh, to quote the Casio website, they wanted to blend elegance 
and casualness in ways that make them go greater with street fashions. It's also worthy to point out that it's available in four variations, two more, uh, more feminine pink gold models, uh, one in champagne gold and one silver with white uh, strap. So the result is a more dressy affair um, and its slenderness definitely makes it um, kind of uh, feel that way as well. Again, we see the octagonal G-Shock shape with the rounded uh, beveled edge there. So distinctive in its design language, unmistakable. And also they've kept the brutalist kind of industrial uh, styling that's so synonymous with the 80s, of course, with these uh, grooves and the indentations on the mono lug structure there. This monochrome color scheme makes it very understated, also extremely compatible when it comes to matching it with different straps and different attire. So the main advantage is unquestionably the size. While most of the watch world has unfortunately chosen to ignore this game changer due to who it's marketed at, the fact that Casio are able to miniaturize the 10 layer system opens up a whole new world of possibilities to G-Shock. Secondly, uh, but most importantly, it retains all the functionality, uh, shock resistance, depth rating, the aesthetics uh, of the quintessential square in a more compact form. This could be the start of a new era for G-Shock, and without the bulk of the first full-sized metal G-Shocks, this instantly becomes a kind of do-it-all Casio that can handle anything life throws at it. A very compelling offering at great value, being typically under 150 bucks on eBay or Amazon, especially when you consider that A1000M, with all its many faults, and we've discussed this watch as well, uh, the G-Shock in essence has corrected them, and not to mention being at around the same price point. So what are the negatives? Unfortunately, there are quite a lot of them here. Uh, while I am super excited about what Casio have achieved here on a technical level, again, we have a bit of a Goldilocks scenario, uh, for lack of a better expression. Uh, this one's too small, this one's too big. I really wish they would come up with a kind of mid-size between these two uh, proportions. Which brings me nicely onto my second negative, the rather dated concept of uh, making watches for specific genders regarding the size, i.e. larger for men's and for women automatically smaller. I think it's quite condescending to presume that every woman wants a pink diamond encrusted tiny little watch. My wife, as you guys know, uh, her collection is entirely men's watches and I'd be happy enough to wear this particular watch. Uh, I'm not the insecure type. I mean, well, <laughs> you can't be insecure if you're going to be doing YouTube. But my point is, if you're confident enough and don't care about the opinions of others, a watch has to be proportional to you at the end of the day. So who cares uh, if, if it's a so-called woman's watch? Thirdly, uh, I have to say I'm not a fan of it being entirely high polish. Uh, it is a massive smudge magnet and because of this wide uh, bezel area it picks up scratches like nobody's business if you are a little bit more OCD inclined you will find great annoyance with this perhaps the most egregious missed opportunity with this watch is unlike the more disappointingly uh, realized A1000 here which as you can see has a more conventional uh, lug design when you change or swap out the strap brings a whole new lease of life to a watch so why they didn't um, have a more traditional lug system here at the back, I mean, okay, so this inner section is 16 millimeters, so you can only have 16 millimeter straps. Had they shaved off a millimeter on each side or have the spring bar go all the way to the metal part of the case, being able to attach a 20 millimeter or an 18 millimeter strap, and this would have elevated the watch to a whole new fun level. This could have been an absolute strap monster. And talking of straps, this strap, let's, let's just look at it, look at that, is far too long. So when it is on the wrist, this is obviously designed for the smaller wrist. Uh, it's just ridiculous, you get all this extra. Lastly, a little nitpick. Uh, I would have liked Casio 
uh, written at the 12 o'clock, I think it would have just given a little bit more balance to the display or the, um, the face of the watch. So, in conclusion, while it certainly is a step in the right direction, it's undoubtedly a strong clue as to what is to come from Casio in the future. Many will find this dressy G-Shock uh, oxymoronic, and the purists will forever want them to remain tough, dependable tool watches. If traditional watches are to survive the onslaught of the characterless, uninspired and pedestrian so-called smart watches, more efforts like this are undeniably welcome. I feel these are very exciting times and I look forward to seeing what they can replicate with this scale of uh, miniaturization, especially with their Annie Digital G-Shocks for example. Or just imagine a full ABC-capable metal range man in titanium in a unisex midsize. I mean, how ruddy cool would that be? Perhaps the most anticipated watch I would like them to make in this scale is the famous Casio Oak that I previously owned and modded. I am fully aware that they released the smaller one recently, but it remains at 42mm, which is still far away from the 39mm true Royal Oak scale. Before this watch, if you wanted a G-Shock in a smaller size, you are limited to the previously reviewed and quite hard to find G-Shock Mini GMN550. That watch has subsequently joined my wife's collection and she wears it hell of a lot. For me, while I deliberate if I should keep this or not, I am less hesitant to sell it off like I did my full-size metal square. Um, in the meantime, I will be returning to the ever-reliable classic and my favourite Casio, the Mission Impossible DW290. So there we have it, a very cool little watch from Casio. Uh, let me know your thoughts down in the comments. What do you think Casio are doing right? What do you think they're doing wrong? What would you like to see from Casio in the future? Oh, and please don't forget to like this video. Very, very important indeed. It's the best way to support the channel. And I will catch you in the next one. Thank you for watching. Ciao.